From the trial of Onogan to the ongoing court case between the Nigerian government and process of industrial development PNID company, Nigeria's judicial has had a very busy 2019. And human rights lawyer Femi Fallon at SAN has asked the Authority General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami SAN, to apologize to Sahara Reporter publisher Omoyele Shore and the former National Security Advisor Sambu Dasuki for their incarceration. This is Plus Politics, and I am Benny Ark. The Nigerian judiciary was really busy this year as it was asked with handling several high-profile and vital cases. Some of these cases include the trial of the former Chief Justice of Nigeria, CJN Walter Onogen, the court case of Omoyele Shore, convener of the hashtag Revolution Now, and the election tribunal case challenging the election that crowned President Muhammad Buhari as president the second time. What lessons can the judiciary learn from all of these issues after they've had to deal with a whole lot this year? Joining us to discuss this are the persons of um, Christian Wogu, a legal practitioner, and also Ayo Ademuluyi, also a legal practitioner. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us this evening. Glad to be here. Glad to have you with us. Now, let's get talking this evening. Um, let's, let's consider the P and ID issue, first of all, as a, as a case study. What, what do you think, in your words, can the Nigerian government do to resolve the P and ID issue? Well, uh, if you ask me, the P and ID uh, issue was more or less a fait accompli for the Nigerian government. This was uh, more or less an agreement that was entered into at a particular point in time. And then by the virtue of the arbitration clause in that, uh, in that agreement, the venue of arbitration is the, is, is, is the United Kingdom. And by virtue of the enforcement of that arbitration clause, yeah. uh, the company, the PID company itself, got uh, an arbitration an arbitral award against the Nigerian, uh, Nigerian government. Be that as it may, it was more or less, as I've said, a fait accompli situation. Yeah. And then they have to resort to negotiation, and that has been the, the, the issue. But going forward, there are lessons uh, to draw from that, uh, from that case. The first lesson is that we need to re-examine the transparency of uh, how government enter into uh, uh, contracts yes. in this part of the world. Uh, we, we, we've seen an horrendous uh, uh, exp expropriation of Nigerians, Nigeria, the, Nigeria, the funds of Nigerian people through that agreement. Now, the, the second question is that to what extent, if any, is the services being rendered by PNID not available by, for, by local content uh, providers as, as provided for the Local Content Act that governs uh, you know, uh, the question of local content availability in the oil and gas uh, industry. Okay. So the third follow-up question that we should ask ourselves is that what is the ver veracity or validity of arbitration, uh, the, the legal framework of arbitration in, in Nigeria vis-a-vis uh, -vis the applicable provisions of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act and the limited uh, provisions therein in that enactment. These are these international protocols and status on arbitration that have expanded the scope of, of law uh, as regards arbitration. So those are the three lessons going forward that we have to take into, into cognizance. All right, Chris and Wogo, you want to add any thoughts to this? What do you think the federal government can do to resolve the PNID issue? Well, essentially, I actually think that that agreement is shrouded with fraud and corruption. And I think that Nigeria should push more on this um, because it's, it comes down to value. What value can one say was even intended to be rendered and had been rendered for which the, um, you can say a breach occurred? Um, my colleague had actually made the point that the ways agreements are entered is to be examined. Our understanding is that the um, Minister of Justice was not even carried along in mm -hmm. the entire negotiation and execution of the agreement. So you find that due process was really not followed. And capacity is a major aspect of contract. Somebody okay. must have capacity to enter a valid contract. And I think that the people that um, executed that contract, and it, it needs to be quite, it's, 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 
It's an agreement that borders on crime, if we look at it very well. And I think that in the international law, international justice, in any civilized nation, that any agreement that's shrouded around crime, corruption, fraud, must be duly questioned. I don't think Nigeria should allow itself to be intimidated by the international community. I think Nigeria should be mobilized. And I mean, you're talking about what should be the, um, what should the government do? do yes. I think they should remobilize and enter into this and question the very validity of that agreement to its roots. I think that if it's properly questioned and thoroughly followed through, that it can actually be vitiated and uh, exactly. that's my take. In, interesting, Christian Wogan, when you were talking, you said you think the agreement was shrouded in fraud and corruption. Now, it's amazing that further research did show that this company, the PNID company, I mean, has not so much had a good reputation when it comes to doing businesses. Now, the question will now be why do you think our government didn't do proper enough research before going to this agreement with PNID? Because their reputation so far isn't so much of a clean one. So what do you think the government omitted in doing before coming into such an agreement with, with the company? Yes, I'm glad you asked this question, um, Benny. The point is that it's becoming a culture, a culture of mediocrity mm. in Nigeria, just because somebody wants to enrich self. There's so whole lot of this happening. It's just that these came to the um, public, as it were. But you find that a whole lot of process is being short-circuited. You know, people are doing things with recklessness, with impunity, you know, arbitrarily. And so long as we keep doing things like this, we keep giving, we keep getting results like we are getting right now. It's just that it cannot obviate or divest the fact that this agreement is rooted and shrouded in fraud and, and criminality and corruption. And um, all we need to do is, if we'll agree to do the same, because it comes down to our, our politics, our elections, our um, so many things about us. You find that it's always questionable. It's a matter of somehow the survival of the fittest. And uh, um, we must come down to a time in our national life when we say, look, enough of this. Let's do things properly. Let's take time and put a structure, systems, that are workable. And until we do that, people will keep exploiting the system because that's exactly what I understand happened here. A system has been exploited and, and in fact, the international community is backing it up. That's the surprise about it. Uh, I, I think it's really unacceptable. Nigeria yeah. is being short-circuited and short-changed here. And I'm not sure it is appropriate and right you know, for the international community to give back in. The a way a system has been exploited, and then who's to take the blame? Who's to take the fall for that? A system that has been exploited, like rightly said, um, the PNID company is not so much known for good reputation. So who should take the fall for that? that that's the point we're making, Benny, that look, that let's agree for that Nigeria, the system, Nigeria has been exploited. Yes. Now, this P and ID organization is a foreign company. It's an expatriate company. company. And you know that expatriates are just... Um, violating Nigeria endlessly. You talk about wherever the, the oil and gas are, that's being produced, how much of it is really being declared? How much of it are being taken offshore without nobody knowing anything about it? It's, it who takes the fall for it? It's, it's, it's our government, for starters, because yes. we can't take responsibility. They must take responsibility. Because that's why they said they are going to vie for election, they're going to protect us, we should vote for them, and we did vote for them. So to that extent, they will take responsibility. But I think that the international community expatriates are also really taking advantage of our poorer systems and maximizing it to its fullest. And okay. that, again, has to be checked. Ayo, your thoughts uh, I have this, a divergent please. opinion from please, uh, what my little friend is saying. Yes. We need to be clear when making use of some terms. When we say, for instance, international community is backing Nigeria, he's backing the PNID. I think he's, we need to be clear and precise. The, what is happening is that you have a, a syndicate, a syndicate of certain persons in the Nigerian government and certain uh, big business elements in the United Kingdom. Now, of course, well, I think what an NFA is trying to uh, refer to is the decision of the UK, uh, there's an high court decision 
that was enforcing that order. That, that decision was later on uh, challenged. Now, we need to put things in clearer perspective. When we say expatriate, there is no way, of course, capital and labor has become globalized. Yeah. So there's no issue about whether you don't want to use white labor or black labor or something. But the question is about the fact that a system is compromised. And when you are asking for the four guy, we need to have an investigation panel. All those who are uh, involved yes. in that PNI discount should be should be arrested and brought to book. We should not uh, beat about the bush about this matter. There are there was the persons of the former Attorney General of the Federation who are okay, who is now facing a, a criminal case, a uh, 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 of the EFCC case. All those persons need to be brought to book. It's, it's in that we can begin to defend the integrity of our legal system and all that. Without unnecessarily now saying we will arbitrate the fact that we need expatriate labor, because that is very key. And even as that, without any prejudice to the fact that, of course, international legal imperialism, the fact that you now you have a world where you have uh, uh, Panama, Panama Papers, the, we have a world where you have the what uh, this uh, journalist exposed, uh, the Wikipedia, Wiki, Wiki, WikiLeaks uh, uh, show. We, we have a world wherein there is a regiment, there's a, there's a, there's a regime of, uh, of expropriation, there's a regime of exploitation across the world. Now, going back to the PNID uh, case, it reflects the collapse of our own system. And it would eventually necessitate that the people of this country take the destiny into their hands by, begin, by beginning to challenge the very essence of our legal institutions, by beginning to challenge the very essence of our political institutions, by beginning to put the right blame where it belongs, which is the ruling elites that are in power today that have uh, made, the country, made the country dry. So that's that just the clarification I want to make. Now, it's clear to see that proper research was not done, and that is why we, we seem to be in the quagmire we are in with the PNID issue right mm -hmm. now. Now, going forward, what would you recommend should be done just to avert cases like this reoccurring? What but, should be done? Okay. Oh, yeah, yes, okay. Yes. Uh, well, number one is the fathers. Uh, of course, due diligence is very, very important. Then number two is the fact that we need a, an urgent review of the legal framework on our arbitration and uh, on, on arbitration in Nigeria. If you look at it, what the, the central question we should ask ourselves is that why is the venue of arbitration being moved to the United Kingdom? Kingdom. When you are entering into a contract with the Nigerian government, why is Nigeria not being the seat of uh, and do you uh, think at this point that it's being politicized? Yes, do you no, think it's, this no, it's also it's also it's apart, apart from being politicized, yes. it's also the fact that we have not developed capacity enough in terms of arbitration practice in Nigeria. I'm talking from the angle of the bar. Yeah. Yeah. How, how, how many Nigerian legal practitioners have been able to de develop their capacity in that aspect? And, and that question falls back to even the enabling law. What is the, what is the integrity of the, of the application uh, of the legal framework on arbitration and conciliation in Nigeria? What is the, uh, for instance, you now have in that same clause that any arbitral award mm, by an arbitral panel can be set aside by the federal court. So if those provisions are still available and within the Arbitration and Constellation Act, it puts uh, limits to the availability of arbitration uh, services in Nigeria. We need to re review all those laws and then have an enabling system for arbitration practice in Nigeria. Now, now Kristen, I wanted to react to what he said, that we don't have the legal framework and arbitration capacity. Yes. And that is why this case has been taken to the UK. Really, Please quickly react well, to that. Somehow, I, I, would, I would beg not to wholesomely agree with counsel. Mm -hmm. I think we have that capacity. Now, the problem here is a problem of people, and he got it really when he said that there's a syndicate, you know, who have organized themselves to exploit the nation via this contract. Now, it's like an ambush, and you know, when an ambush, no matter how equipped you are and you face an ambush, it takes extraordinary maneuver to get around it. I think that we have capacity to have taken that arbitration, and that arbitration had no reason because the contract was entered here, the um, race, the reason for the contract was here. Yes, I think that that could still be challenged. I, incidentally, um, the, um, uh, the, that very contract hadn't really been made public for us to thoroughly review mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I think that we could still insist 
that the arbitration hold in Nigeria. But I'm not sure whether the arbitration holds here or elsewhere, whether the outcome will be different, depending on how the agreement itself is worded. Because yes. if it is worded in such a way that you know, um, this will be the outcome. There's already an outcome that was predetermined, you know, because people want to exploit. But that's, that's what I understand was all this was all about. Nigerians has cap have capacity to do this arbitration. Our legal system is strong enough to handle it. It's just that um, I, I still go back to the fact that um, the root of the uh, yeah, many, many, the, many, many Nigerians will actually argue that with you. We're going to come to a few issues soon on um, our judiciary, which but us know a whole lot of stuff to say we have capacity um, to handle this. But quickly, before we run this segment, or let me just quickly ask um, Ayo. Yeah. Now, do you think this is already a predetermined situation? Going by all everything available, do you think so? I, I do. I don't. I don't think so. I okay. think we need to be scientific about the parts. Yes. Uh, you, you it's called that the Bari regime itself uh, inherited that P and ID agreement, and if you're going through the facts, they declare themselves in a in a catch twenty two situation in which an order has been made by the High Court in the UK for enforcement of that. Uh, amount of money, which is running into billions of dollars of uh, pounds. Uh, sorry. So the fact was that they were they, are, they had to now respond in a reactive manner, file their appropriate application set, to set aside the the, the the arbitral award, and then possibly they enter the negotiation and order. But the central issue is the fact that, as I've, I've, I've already stated earlier, is that we have a porous system, which my learned friend has agreed with me, that enables. Uh, persons in government to go enter into nebulous contracts with uh, uh, com companies who don't have the prestige and goodwill, even in their local uh, jurisdictions, uh, who now enter into all those kind of fraudulent uh, uh, contracts uh, in Nigeria with Nigerian government and use and that uh, the pipelines through which funds are, 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 are sourced away. So it, it's not predetermined in that objective sense, but in the subjective sense. Yes. The subjective sense, we see a play out. Even the fact that the, 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 at the end of the day, the judgment, the arbitral award was already negotiated, and now we now got the revelation that even the company itself does not even have that capacity. You should, you should quickly round up to, now. To do it's Christian so, seems to have something he wants to say uh, before we well, round up this much, segment. Because you did mention, you, you think there's already a predetermined outcome on, on, this, no, on this case? I, I think so, because okay. look, this is a company that is actually said to have a registration. Um, capacity in Nigeria has been. And then you find that at the end of the day, it's just one man behind it, just one man. And uh, like we said, that doesn't seem to have integrity and history and capacity to even execute the contract. So I think there is some kind of determined outcome involved. But let me just make this mention this. This is like a financial crime. And I think that this is exactly why EFCC is set up. My take now is that EFCC is doing what the police is supposed to be doing and not really going about getting down to the reasons why corruptions and financial crimes occur and stemming and stopping it. I think that this is a huge challenge. This is something that EFC is definitely to revisit and find a way not to make it reoccur after this time out. Uh, legal practitioners, Christian Wogu and Ayo Ademilu, thank you for your contributions to this segment. We'll be back after this break. <laughs>